Back in uh, May, Merkel went to visit the Pope. They had quite a long talk, 45 minutes, unusually long for a private papal audience. Now, this comment is from Scrape TV, which sounds a dreadful name, but it is a French one, so what it means, I don't know. But um, it, it's fairly apparent to just about everyone that Europe is in the midst of a change, perhaps a dramatic change, that could forever reshape the continent. That has happened before in that area of the world, of course, many times before, but always with a great deal of violence. Now the leaders of two of the most influential and powerful of those European countries have met and started to discuss the future of the region and presumably to consolidate their power base and work out exactly how to deal with all the dissenters and those who would undermine their grand vision for the future of a greater Europe. Well, we don't know what they did talk about, but I guess that's probably not too far off the mark. So his fellow Jesuits have been working very hard. There has been a Jesuit European office set up in 1956 specifically to promote the power of the church in Europe. Uh, and they work together with the Commission of Bishops. This is the Roman Catholic Bishops Conferences. Uh, every month they have a combined newsletter which has some interesting articles. And the Jesuits have obviously been working very hard to achieve the growth of the influence of the church in Europe. And I thought there's a quite interesting summary from the Sunday Telegraph uh, back in May. <laughs> Europe's churches are emerging as a powerful pole of authority, filling a vacuum left by political parties of all stripes tainted by the financial crisis. German leaders may be more ready to heed criticism from the Vatican and their own clergy than from club Mediterranean politicians. He is just about to have a visit a week tomorrow um, from Martin Schulz, who is the president of the European Parliament, and it is expected that on that visit he will be asked formally to come and speak to uh, the EU Parliament uh, in Brussels. Uh, he did uh, extend an invitation to him uh, at his inauguration back in March. Uh, Benedict was invited to go, but declined actually to go. The last Pope to go to the European Parliament was Pope John Paul, in 1988, when he made that wonderful analogy, using the words of Jesus, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and things of God to God, he more or less, but he put it very politely, is, well, you're the politicians, you look after the things of Caesar, and you leave to the church the things of God, we'll look after that. So it will be very interesting, you know, when he does go and what he says it could mark a, quite a step forward. His worldwide appeal was shown when he went to Brazil. He came from Argentina. Of course, this uh, World Youth Day was organised um, several years ago, so just a coincidence that uh, it was in his neighbouring country of Brazil. But it, it was a, a tremendous success from a PR point of view. Crowds of people came and two to three million, just depending which account you read, uh, gathered to listen to his farewell mass. Central to his worship is the worship of Mary. Mary is everything to him. And in fact, so very shortly uh, from Fatima will come the statue that is there of Mary, and it is being taken to Rome, um, a week on uh, 13th, there's a Sunday, Sunday week, isn't it? Statue of Our Lady of the Rosary of Fatima will travel all the way from Portugal to the Vatican, where Pope Francis is planning on consecrating the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The Marian Day ceremony, which is scheduled to take place at the Vatican on Sunday, October the 13th, will be attended by hundreds of religious movements, and institutions that have a special Marian devotion. This Mass is one of the last main events scheduled in the Year of Faith. 
the statue of Our Lady will make its way to Rome at the request of Pope Francis, who has shown a great devotion to Mary since the very first day of his pontificate. He goes and worships at the shrine uh, of Mary uh, in the uh, Basilica of Mary Major. Um, and uh, he, as I say, he has dedicated his uh, pontificate to her and is now going to consecrate the world to Mary, to plead with Mary uh, to uh, improve the conditions of the world and the church. And this is all part of the, the blasphemy, isn't it? We know that poor Mary is long dead and buried. She'll be horrified to know at, uh, what is made of her by the Roman Catholic Church. But of course it will be a, a wonderful bonanza. Uh, people will come week on Sunday, flock into Rome, um, and I wonder if the Protestants, and I wonder whether the Christadelphians are going to say anything about such blasphemy as replacing Jesus. If you read his speeches, Jesus hardly gets mentioned. It's Mary this, Mary that. Terrible. And then, of course, the biggest bonanza tourist-wise is uh, planned for next year, April the 27th when the so-called canonisation of John Paul II and John XXIII. We know how the world press gathered at the funeral of John Paul II. Um, uh, and they will, you know, all around the world, the whole world will be looking at Rome at this time. And we know, you know, this is so fictitious. It's part, as I say, of the lying wonders that come from this power. Just at the beginning of September, on September the 7th, again there was a huge gathering in Rome, estimated 100,000 people gathered in Rome in response to the appeal that the Pope made for peace in Syria. The Pope had written to all the Western leaders appealing to them not to join in an attack on Assad and he dedicated this Saturday as a day of fasting and prayer. And around the world, religious leaders of all different hues joined in this peace in Syria. Crowds estimated, as I say, one for every person that has been killed in the warfare in Syria in the last two and a half years. Why is the Pope so interested that the West don't go in and overthrow Assad? Well, it's very simple. that In Syria... 10% of the Syrians are Christian. The majority of them are Orthodox. Uh, it's a minority are Roman Catholic. But a considerable amount. And they are being terribly persecuted. Uh, Homs, which was one of the great centres, used to have 160,000 Christians in it. There's now less than 1,000. The so-called rebels are very... Islamist and very anti-Christianity. In fact, it's estimated that uh, half a million Christians have had to flee. And their aim is the Al-Qaeda, who is the, the main thrust of the, um, the so-called rebels, and will say, we'll look at this, God willing, next time. Uh, they vowed to make Syria Christian-free. And so you can see why the Pope is so keen that Assad doesn't fall, because under Assad, the Christians have had an enjoyable life. They have prospered under his rule. Although he is a Muslim, he belongs to this Alawite sect, which is a minority sect, and not extremist at all. And he has given great sanctuary to the Christians. And so it, it is in the interest that if he remains in power, then the Christians have a hope of being protected. If Assad falls and the rebels, Al-Qaeda and the Chechen terrorists um, get their way, then Christianity will be wiped out. So it was interesting that this put the Pope and Putin on the same side. Putin has several reasons why he wants Assad in power, and we shall look at those, but one of them is the Orthodox Christians there. So they were singing from the same song sheet. And of course the only safe place for Christians in the Middle East is in Israel. 
That's the uh, most remarkable thing. But in Egypt, in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Arabia, they've all been persecuted. Only in Israel are they flourishing. So that brings us to this remarkable change of attitude on the part of a pope to the Jews. Uh, this was uh, an article just uh, a few days ago. Pope Francis and Rabbi Squawka uh, make history in the Vatican. Never before in the history of Christian-Jewish relations have a pope and a rabbi celebrated their friendship by living in the Vatican together for several days, sharing all meals, including two Jewish festivals and the Sabbath at which the rabbi said prayers in Hebrew and discussing what more they can do together to promote dialogue and peace in the world. That's what actually happened over the past four days at the Vatican guest house where Pope Francis lives and where his friends from Buenos Aires, Rabbi Squawka, had been his guests from September the 25th to this day. By acting in this way, the Pope and Rabbi are sending an extraordinary message of friendship, dialogue and peace, not only to their respective religious communities, but also to the whole world. Earlier in the month, or earlier in uh, last month, sorry, um, the Jewish um, World Jewish Congress met at the Vatican, uh, and warm reception they had there in a statement following the meeting. Lauder, who's the chairman of that group, uh, praised Pope Francis and said, never in the past 2,000 years have relations between the Catholic Church and the Jewish people been so good. And he, the Pope promised to use his influence to help the Jews who got problems in Poland over the ban on ritually slaughtered meat. Um, and also to help with the um, various problems that uh, the Jews have with the Christians. Again, we recall that one of the first heads of government uh, to meet with the Pope was uh, President Perez, who is the President of Israel, on April the 30th, not long after the inauguration, he was uh, there and met the Pope. Um, he has invited the Pope to come to Israel in very warm terms. The new pontiff accepts the invitation by the Israeli president to visit Jerusalem with willingness and joy, said the spokesman. And Perez says, I'm expecting you in Jerusalem, not just me, but the whole country of Israel, Perez told the Pope in the presence of reporters after 30 minutes of private talks in the Vatican's Apostolic Palace. And he presented the Pope with um, a Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament, in which he had handwritten this inscription to His Holiness, Pope Francis, so that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you go. With deep esteem, Shimon Paris, President of the State of Israel. So this is a remarkable about turn. From centuries of persecution, here we have the Roman Catholic Church reaching out to the Jews in these last days. We looked at Prophecy Day of how Russia too is wanting to reach out a hand of friendship to Israel. She wants to have play a part in the exploitation of the vast oil and gas deposits. At the moment, Syria is a bit of a problem, uh, and I'm sure Putin will be very glad when whatever is going to happen there takes place so that he can forward his work of working with Israel. And we know that Israel, in these last days, is to make friends with people that she shouldn't. And we know that because the scripture is very clear. Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 20, uh, the earlier part um, of it is talking about things in the past, but when we come to verse 20 of Isaiah chapter 10, it is clearly the time when the Lord Jesus is king. It should come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more stay upon, support, lean, upon him that smote him, but shall stay upon Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. 
So here's a picture of the Jews with Jesus as their king and they are trusting in God and no longer trusting in those who smote them. Now, who is it who's going to smite them? Well, we know that it's what is referred to in earlier, the king of Assyria, the Russian power. Uh, and not just a Russian power, but this is Daniel's image standing up with its golden head, its Babylonian head, with its eyes and mouth, the papacy, uh, and Russia and Europe are going to come against Israel and break her up as a country and try to drive her into the sea. So what God is warning us is that Israel is going to make friends with those who smite them. And so it's a wonderful confirmation of the truth of the word of God after two and a half thousand years. That's exactly what we're seeing. This new friendship with the Roman Catholic Church of all people and with Russia of all people. We know that they will turn out to be perfidious friends and will smite them. There's another fascinating passage earlier in Isaiah chapter 2. Remember the earlier verses talk about the kingdom established, the hill of God, all nations coming up to Zion and that wonderful picture of the kingdom. And then it tells us, as so often happens in these passages, that that's the opening. How do we get there? Where have we come from? Well, we come from this situation. Therefore... Thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob. And that's what God is going to do. He's going to forsake his people because of their relationships with other nations. Instead of trusting in him, they're trusting in their neighbours and their friends and uh, other people. And so God is going to uh, bring, go down in order to bring humble Israel. So they are forced to recognise that they can only trust in God. So you you couldn't get a better description of Israel today than what Isaiah penned two and a half thousand years ago. Why? Because they have, they be replenished from the east, and that's one of the things we're going to be looking at next time. That Israel is making this friendship with the Arab nations, the Sheba and Dedan, the Gulf states. Scripture tells us that's going to happen. It doesn't say that God thinks that's a wonderful thing. It just tells us you know, that is going to be the situation. And they're being replenished from the east. Their sooth sounds like the Philistines. Strong says act covertly like the Philistines. Now the Philistines were very good at um, trying to forecast the future. Well, I don't know whether they were good at it, but they were well known for... Uh, watching the clouds and watching the leaves as well as the livers and that kind of thing like the Babylonians to try and tell the future. Uh, And isn't this exactly what Israel does today and is very good at acting covertly to try and find with her intelligence, you know, where the chemical weapons are and what Iran's doing. This is a picture of Israel today. Uh, They please themselves, they strike hands, ally, are friends with the children of strangers. And this is, as I say, these new alliances which she's making with Russia and with the Vatican. Their land is full of silver and gold. Neither is there any end of their treasures. That, that, that's what we're beginning to see come to pass. Their land is also full of horses. Neither is there any end of their chariots. And again, this is the language of Isaiah's day, but we would say, you know, anti-ballistic missiles and all the rest of it. The weaponry, this is what they're trusting in. Their land is full of idols. What are idols? Things that take the place of God. Things that you trust in and bow down and think are so marvellous. They worship the work of their own hands, which their own fingers have made. And this is the remarkable thing about Israel. She has, with her own fingers, made incredible defences and weapons and all sorts of technology. They're not trusting in God. And so they've got to be humble. But how wonderful it is, brothers and sisters, that we can live in this day. What brothers and sisters of 40 years ago couldn't see, we can see. How all these pieces of the jigsaw are dropping into place. It is so exciting. And so, as Isaiah said, darkness is going to cover the earth. It's going to cover his people. It will cover the earth too. 
grows darkness the people, but the light is going to arise, the light of the coming of the Son of God and the establishment of the kingdom in Israel so that the whole world is filled with the radiance of the kingdom of God and the whole world will come to know that Jesus is indeed the King. And so how thankful we are, brothers and sisters, to live in these exciting times, to be reassured, hold on, things haven't gone wrong. We can trust our traditional understanding of these things. The word of God is so powerful and so true. We just have to be patient. Everything will drop into place at the right time. Thank you.